For over 19 years, Morningstar Church has been a ray of light and a beacon of hope in St. Charles County. From our modest beginnings in what was then the Biltmore Banquet Center, we have reached up to God in worship, reached in to love and support one another, and reached out to serve and bless others. Never settling for limiting church to the way it's always been done, our purpose was to be a church for those who weren't connected with God, to attract imperfect persons from all walks of life and connect them to a perfect God in community with one another. God has used Morningstar Church to influence both our current and the coming generation, raising up dozens of pastors and persons serving in full-time ministry. We've birthed two daughter churches, launched a second campus, started a recovery ministry which has brought freedom to hundreds struggling with hurts, habits, and hangups. And we've created our very own local outreach center, which is second to none in our area. Through Morningstar's New Hope Resource Center, our volunteers offer personal counseling and tangible resources to those experiencing trials and transitions in life. This is just a taste of what Plus Side Church is all about, meeting people where they are, helping them take next steps to the abundant life in Jesus Christ. Today, God's direction for Morningstar Church has never been more clear. By honoring and building on our past, God has renewed our vision to be a well where persons inside and outside the church are being refreshed, restored, and resourced to live out Jesus' great commandment by enriching the relationships with God, themselves, and others, as well as fulfilling the great commission to go and make disciples of all nations by each one of us relentlessly and intentionally reaching one more for Jesus. To make this vision a reality, we must stack hands, seek hard after God's heart, and be willing to sacrifice. Plus Side is an opportunity to break free from the bondage of debt we've incurred from buying our land and building our campus in Darden Prairie. But Plus Side is more than just breaking free from debt. It's also about being free, being free to impact individuals and families for Jesus. It's time to grow our ministry over to the Plus Side. And for this to happen, it will take each of us seeking God's will and saying yes to our part of Plus Side. Welcome, uh, a special welcome to those of you who are guests today. It is great to have you with us. My name is Mike Charney. I'm lead pastor here. Uh, welcome to those of you here at Darden, those of you joining us online or via podcast. We are concluding, wrapping up this series that we've entitled Plus Side. What does life look like on the plus side for a church? What does life look like as an individual on the plus side. Um, for those of you who are uh, new, you heard our, our vision. We've been unpacking what a plus side church, what plus side life looks like in terms of the well that God has called us to be, where we bring people to be refreshed, restored, resourced to enrich relationships and reach one more for Jesus. We've been talking about how God's called us to be a well for bold prayer for equipping people to go before the throne of God and ask boldly for God to do big, impossible, miracle things. Because if it's easy, why does God need to get involved, right? We've also talked about how God's called us to be a well for worship, not just gathering for an hour one time a week, but how we can have this 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week relationship where worship uh, is just pervasive in our life. We've talked about how God has called us to be a well for reaching the next generation, that, that this generation of young people, students that are growing up, are, are, are being under, are attacked more than any other generation. And we've got to equip them with who they are, their identity in Jesus Christ, so they can stand strong against those attacks as well as bring Jesus to the next generation following them. We've talked about being a well for mission and outreach, that it's not just about taking care of our own, but, but to use our resources to bless those who are going through transition and crisis. Our New Hope Resource Center is a perfect example of how we as a church are postured to serve other people, and not just serve, but to even sacrifice. We need to learn what sacrifice is all about because we live in a very selfie generation, right? And it's more than just taking the picture selfie. We live in a selfie-indulgent, selfie-centered world where everything revolves around each one of us. We've got to learn to step outside of that. We need to learn to, to do what Jesus has called us to do, to be willing to take up our cross, to be willing to follow him daily. Uh, Jesus said, hey, I've come not to, to be served, but to serve and even give my life as a ransom for many. 
So what does it look like for us to be a church and model putting the needs of others above our own? And, and then finally today, we're talking about being a well to reach the one. And if you've been around for the last two years since we've put together our vision statement, you're well acquainted with who the one is. But if you're new, let me describe the one to you. The one is someone who doesn't yet know uh, God in a very personal way. May think that God is this angry God sitting on a throne waiting to, you know, catch you in a sin so that he can punish you and send you to hell. You haven't yet experienced the, the God that Jesus uh, brought flesh to when he came and lived among us, who he showed uh, the face of God, a kind and compassionate and loving God, a God that would go to extraordinary lengths to let us know that he loves us, that he's got a place reserved in heaven with our name on it. And I could go on and on, all kinds of descriptions about who the one is, but they say a picture's worth a thousand words, and so this video story is probably worth a trillion words. Take a look at Victoria. My mother was an alcoholic and a drug addict. My parents became separated when I was three and divorced when I was five. I had a lot of abuse uh, while growing up. Um, my mother would lock me into my room and give me a bucket to use the bathroom in for days at a time. With that on top of um, the rest of my life being told that I wasn't good enough, there was nothing that I could do um, where anybody would love me, my value just cut, got cut down less and less. My name is Victoria Arthur and I am the one. Growing up, I thought God was just mean, um, that if we didn't do what we were told, that automatically we were going to hell and that there was, um, there's nothing we could do to um, get into his good graces or in his favor. I had not realized that I had become my mother, that I had become the person that I uh, had vowed so long ago that I wouldn't be. I was um, invited to come to celebrate recovery here at Morningstar Church. And I let everybody know that I was pagan, that I did not believe in God. Um, and I expected people to um, avoid me and ignore me like the plague. What had really captured my attention was the worship music. A friend of mine had said, you know, if you really like the worship music here on Thursday, you should come with me uh, to a weekend service. And I blew her off a couple times because I figured that I might explode if I came to church because I'm pagan. And um, I finally said yes and came to a Saturday service. And of course the music was amazing. But then hearing a message the messages from Mike, um, it, it made sense. It was something I can tangibly use. I was welcomed with love the same way that I was welcomed in Celebrate Recovery. I finally accepted Christ in November of 2015. He is not the angry deity that I thought he was. He's not sitting there waiting for me to fail. And there's a love that's greater than I've ever, ever had or have ever imagined having. Good stuff. Now, if you knew Victoria, you know, when she first came, you would have agreed with me that she was one of the sweetest pagans you'd ever meet. Um, but it's been so cool to see the transformation in the last four or five years of, of her heart and soul and how uh, after experiencing the love of God that, that she has just blossomed and doing great things for, for Jesus and, uh, and the kingdom. 
Um, hey, here's how Jesus talked about the one. Jesus actually talked about the one a whole lot. Uh, one time he told this parable, maybe you'll uh, remember this. If a man owns 100 sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 in the hills and go look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he's happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that didn't wander off. And in the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. Jesus said, I'm that shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. This is a picture of who God is. He is willing to leave the flock. Jesus was willing to step out of the comfort of heaven, even if it would have just been for you. For one person, he was going to leave everything. And when he finds that one who was lost, puts it on his shoulders, brings it home, and rejoices. There is a party in heaven. Here's another way Jesus talked about the one. He said, again, the king kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Now, I grew up understanding that the one was Jesus, that when I discover Jesus in my life, I should be willing to leave everything, sell everything, cash it all in, just like those disciples, and follow Jesus. And there's a truth there. There really is, but it's not the one Jesus was making. Jesus is saying here that he, Jesus, is the merchant. When Jesus found the pearl of great value, which is us, you and me, when Jesus found the pearl of great value, he was willing to give everything, to cash it in. As we said last week, you are his treasure. He was willing to make a sacrifice, and a sacrifice is being willing to give up something we love or value for something we love or value even more. And Jesus was willing to give up his own life because we are that pearl of great price. When I think about people who are willing to go over and beyond, go to like extraordinary, ridiculous lengths to save a life, I can't help but thinking about one of my favorite movies. I'm kind of a movie guy, and uh, one of my all-time favorites is Saving Private Ryan. Anybody else kind of like Saving Private Ryan? Great show. I'm a Tom Hanks guy. I'll probably do this character first person Christmas next year. Probably not. But uh, I've done Forrest Gump and The Conductor, but um, probably not. The, if, if you're not familiar with the, the movie, great movie by Spielberg, um, apparently there were four boys in the Ryan family. Three of them got killed on D-Day, Normandy invasion, World War II. Word gets all the way up to the chain of command to General uh, um, Marshall in Washington, D.C. He dispatches Captain Miller, played by Tom Hanks, says to Captain Miller, find eight of your best guys. I want you to do whatever it takes to find the one remaining Ryan boy, James Ryan, Private Ryan. Whatever it takes, I want you to find him and I want you to bring him back home. God forbid that one mom should lose all four boys in, you know, this war. And so Tom Hanks selects eight of his best men. They go all through, um, you know, France during World War II. All kinds of pain, all kinds of adversity, sacrifice. In fact, eight of the nine people lose their life. But they complete the mission. They find James Ryan, and they eventually get him home back to the States. It's amazing to me. It's amazing those kind of stories. Lone Survivor is another one of, you know, the, the, the real story of, of the uh, uh, Navy SEAL that got trapped in Afghanistan and how people would just continue wave after wave. I mean, that's kind of the, the, the bond that happens when, when people go to, to war, that they are willing to sacrifice, go through pain and adversity, even the cost of their life to save a brother or sister in arms. Now, there's a, there's a story in Scripture, and it's not about people in the, the armed forces, but it, but it describes the lengths that a group of guys were willing to go to to save their friend. And if you have your Bible, I invite you to go ahead and turn in the New Testament, the second book, the second gospel in the New Testament, the gospel of Mark, and we're going to begin at chapter 2. 
in Mark's gospel, um, things happen pretty quickly. There are no birth narratives in, in Mark's gospel. So Matthew and, and Luke have the birth stories of Jesus in Bethlehem. Uh, in in uh, Ma- Mark, we basically begin with Jesus and John the Baptist, Jesus being baptized at the Jordan River. Then he goes and starts his ministry. And from day one, Jesus goes out into Galilee and starts his ministry and great things begin to happen. And so we're just at the start of Jesus' ministry. Mark chapter 2, verse 1. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. Now, maybe you didn't realize that Jesus' home base during his adult life, during his ministry, his home base was in Capernaum, uh, a pretty good uh, sized city on the Sea of of Galilee. Uh, Most of you remember that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, right? His mom and dad grew up in Nazareth. There was a census. They had to go to Bethlehem for the census to be registered. And while there, Mary gave birth to Jesus. They stayed in Bethlehem for two years. That's when the wise men came and visited two years later, right? Um, then, uh, then an angel warned Joseph that Herod was seeking Jesus' life. So G- uh, Joseph takes Mary and baby Jesus, and they go to Egypt for several years. Then the angel tells Joseph, hey, Herod died. It's safe to come back. And so when Joseph and Mary come back from Egypt, they go to Nazareth. And so Jesus grew up as a boy in Nazareth, but some point along the line, Jesus' dad, Joseph, we don't know if he died or what happened to him, just kind of drops out of the scene. And then for whatever reason, maybe Mary had family in Capernaum, but Mary and her children, Jesus and his his siblings, moved to this town of Capernaum. Pretty big city there uh, uh, called Capernaum. Now, uh, when the people heard that Jesus had come home right after starting his ministry, his fame had, you know, began to spread so much, they gathered in large numbers. There was no room left, not even outside the door, as he preached the word to them. People were gathered arm to arm, you know, standing room only inside the house. They'd spilled over. If there was a fire marshal, the fire marshal would have had to break up the scene. It was totally unsafe. And into that scene, some men came, bringing to Jesus a paralyzed man carried by four of them. We don't know how many men. It might have been 10, 12. might have been, you know, two dozen. But we know that four of them were stretcher bearers. Four of them were on either end of the stretcher, and on that stretcher laid one of their friends who was paralyzed. Since they could not get to him, uh, him to Jesus, because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. You remember this story, right, if you grew up in in Sunday school? So homes in those days, homes in the Middle East, wasn't a lot of wood, still not a lot of wood over there. It's just one giant rock. They built homes out of stone. Um, And in those days, uh, they had a staircase. Usually every house had a staircase on the outside, and it led up to the roof. These days, if if your house has an outdoor, you know, uh, living area, if you've got a TV or something, a couple couches outside, like that is upscale, cool, totally love that. In those days, most every house had an outdoor living space, little tiki torches, wet bar, big screen, and... uh, So that's kind of what they did. It's kind of the double the space. And so these guys couldn't get through to Jesus because of the crowd, so many people. So they they carried him up these outside stairs. They kind of went over and discerned kind of here's where Jesus sounds like he is. They began digging through the roof. The roof would have been made of, of like straw and mud, kind of, you know, put together and baked. And so Jesus, you can imagine Jesus is in there teaching, right? He's probably healing people. And, and all of a sudden, mud and straw starts to fall on him. He's like, what is going on? And he, he looks up, and all of a sudden, there's a hole, and then there's light. And then there's this dude just being dropped down in front of him. And he's probably lowered on ropes. And I know that because that's how my Sunday school teacher taught me, and she was always right. We don't know. I mean, it just says they lowered him. They, maybe they had blankets and they only got him so far. It was a 10-foot ceiling instead of an 8-foot. They, they had to drop him the last two feet. And it's like, boom, sorry, I don't know. But he didn't feel anything because he's paralyzed. So that was good. I know, I know I shouldn't have gone there. But I don't have a huge mercy gift, all right? They lowered the guy down. Here's what I want you to see next, all right? Here's what I want you to see. When Jesus saw... Their faith. Who's there? The guy's on the roof, right? He said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, here's the deal. You read the story. Go home and read the story. The man 
gets healed. The man came to Jesus lying on a mat. He walked out that day on his own two feet. What Jesus takes note of is the fact that these guys, these guys on the roof were not going to let anything stand between their friend and Jesus. They knew that Jesus represented the one and only hope that their friend would have to get up off his mat and have his life changed forever. And they were willing to do whatever it took to get them to him. My question today is, who's your one? Who's your one? Who's someone beyond the walls of our church but within your reach? Beyond the walls of our church, within your reach. Someone in your circle of influence. Maybe it's a a friend. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's a neighbor. You know them well enough to know that they really don't have a relationship with God. They don't mention God in a positive way. You don't think that they go to any church. Maybe Christmas and Easter, you know, every so often. But for all intents and purposes, they don't have a relationship with God. And it could be that they're going through some sort of transition right now. It might be a literal health crisis like the man. They might be lying on their kind of metaphorical mat in need of healing. Maybe they're going through just some kind of job change right now and, and they've been laid off or they're fearing cutbacks. And, and, and maybe it's, it's some sort of relationship. Maybe they have problems at home. Maybe their relationship with their spouse is on the rocks. Maybe, maybe one of their children is kind of, you know, prodigaling and just running away and making bad choices. Or, or maybe they're just in a season of disillusionment and we've all been there. We've all been in those places where we grew up and the things we learned, that we, we, we kind of took it, they worked for us and worked for us and life was great. And then all of a sudden, the things that we always did stopped working. And it's kind of like the wheels come off and we begin to question everything. Who's your one? Where are they right now? What are they potentially going through? Sometimes our one is actually a family member. They live in the same house that we live in. And that was the case for Victoria. See, Victoria was a one who had a one, and her one was her husband, Kevin. Take a look. Grew up in kind of a Christian family. Uh, I was baptized Catholic. I was a confirmed Lutheran. Um, I wandered away from the faith for quite a number of years and was actually a very outspoken atheist. It never really clicked. Um, You know, you'd go to Sunday services, you'd go to Sunday school when we were kids, and nothing ever really clicked. It was just one of those things that it was something you had to do because your parents were dragging you, you know? You know, spent time um, doing drugs uh, as a teenager, drinking, going to parties, getting into fights, just general things that if I had known or had felt that someone was watching me and someone was watching over me, it it, it might have been different. With Morningstar, um, my wife Victoria started through Morningstar with Celebrate Recovery. Um, She is a recovering alcoholic, uh, soon to be four years sober through Celebrate Recovery. It never really clicked. Again, I was, I was a fervent atheist. Eventually, my atheism calmed down to where it's my personal choice. I shouldn't push my, push my views on anyone else or call them wrong or anything. So it eventually did calm down, but the getting connected with Morningstar was through my wife. And if it wasn't for Morningstar, I would not have had such a wonderful and beautiful experience coming back to Christianity. I don't, I don't believe I would. I I can only imagine how difficult it was for her to walk the same path of rebirth and walk the same path of, you know, the path of righteousness with an atheist at home and with someone who wasn't necessarily questioning everything that she did, but also provided a devil's advocate to the other side, almost a sounding board for her faith and her personal growth. I can't imagine. But through her transformation, through Celebrate Recovery, and through her transformation with the people at Morningstar, it was, it, it was something that if I'm going to come back, if God will allow me again to come back home, 
that is my home. That's where I have to be. Um, so my first church service, I was like, yeah, I, 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 I want to go back. I want to see what else is there. Um, second defining moment, the biggest defining moment for me was just recently I got my 30-day chip of sobriety through sexual addiction from Celebrate Recovery with Morningstar, and my wife actually gave it to me. And that's, that's a really big thing for me to be able to be around so many people that are understanding and caring and loving and non-judgmental to be able to be in that environment enough for me to confess not only my sins but my strengths to people around me that love me and feeling that sense of connectivity is just amazing to me. That's why God has called us to be a well. That's why God sent me out here 19 years ago to, to start a church for prodigals like Kevin. Somebody who grew up in a church and wandered away and went to that far off land and then had an opportunity to come back and, and experience God in a fresh new way. That God wasn't there to shame him. That God was there to welcome him, to embrace him with uh, unconditional love and amazing grace. Here's what uh, Kevin's story and Victoria's story, and I think what Jesus is, is trying to teach us, that, that most persons literally are just one person away from Jesus. One, it, it, most persons just one relationship, that there's somebody, every person outside the walls of our church, every person in our community who doesn't go to church and who doesn't know Jesus knows someone in a church and, and are just kind of waiting, honestly, for an invitation. All of us know people. All of us know those kind of ones who are beyond the walls of our church and all those people are waiting for is an invitation for us to invite them to, to come to one of these taste and see events every single weekend that we call worship or maybe it's some service project or maybe it's an event or maybe it's celebrate recovery. But this is the number one way that people come to church. We have people who are new to the community who grew up in church and they move here and they're looking for a church. We have a lot of people who are going through crisis and they've tried everything else and so Jesus is kind of a last resort. But the number one reason that people come to church is because someone invited them. In fact, show of hands, how many people here, how many people here came back to church or came to church for the first time because somebody invited you to come? Keep your hands up. That's, I'm actually surprised that more people uh, haven't got their, their hands up. That is, do you see that? It's because somebody cared enough, right, to extend an invitation. And, and, and it's not hard for us. I mean, it's not like we're those friends trying to get a paralytic to Jesus and there's a crowd there and we've got to carry him up these stairs and we've got to dig a roof, you know, apart and drop our friend down here in front of the pastor. We don't have to do that. I mean, the biggest obstacle we have is right in here, in our own heart, right, in our own mind. We create this fear that, I might be overstepping. I might be pushing my religion on. They might not. And yet, 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 let me just invite you to, to look at things a, a new way. The very reason that you might have a relationship with that person might be God ordained. It might be God who put you and that person in a circle of connectivity. For the very reason that you would be the conduit between God and that individual. And that person may be waiting. They may look at you. Hopefully, if you've got a relationship with Jesus, there's been a change in your life. There's something attractive about you. And they see that. They not only see it, they want that for themselves. And probably, they're wondering why you haven't invited me. Is there something wrong with me? Am I not good enough to come to your church? Easter provides a pretty good opportunity for us to make that invitation. So the number one weekend... That and Christmas, not surprisingly, when people are open to the invitation. And most persons are just one relationship away. It reminds us something we say all the time here, that God has uniquely and intentionally positioned each one of us to reach one for Jesus. 
This is God's calling card. This is what he sent Jesus to come and seek and save that which is lost. This is the most important thing. These are the pearls of great value, and God has invited us to join him in the mission of seeking and saving others. Now, let me, uh, let me remind you one thing before I close. You guys have done a great job over the years of continuing to invite your one. But there's another thing going on in this sermon. It's the thing that I discovered for the first time uh, reading this uh, passage, studying it several weeks ago in preparation for this. I'd never seen this before. Uh, Of all the times, dozens of times I'd read this passage, I'd never seen this before. That there was an easier way to get their friend to Jesus. These guys did not have to climb up these stairs. These guys did not have to figure out where Jesus was, tear the roof apart and lower their friend down. There was a simpler solution. The crowd could have just moved aside. Have you ever thought of that? I mean, it's, it's always on this, oh, they go over and beyond. It was so, but here's a crowd of people, and if they would have just realized there's somebody back here on a stretcher who needs to get to Jesus, and I'm going to move aside because it's more important for a paralyzed man to be healed than for me to hear another parable And it began to to get me thinking, what do we do in the church oftentimes? How are we that obstacle that the crowd is so focused on Jesus inside? Teach me, teach me, tell me, tell me, tell me. And there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes we can be so, ah, that we forget there are broken people out here. And part of our mission is to bring those people. And the other part of our mission is when some of our friends bring their friends to step aside and let people connect with Jesus. So let me, let me kind of share with you uh, three real quick points before we close about what plus side churches do so that they don't become a barrier. First of all, they don't complain about the church. They don't say, well, you know, our, we don't have a real church here. We don't have stained glass windows and organs and, you know, hymnals. We don't sing hymns at our church. It's not really a real church. And, you know, the music's always too loud. And the preacher talks too long. And Quite honestly, the, you know, the coffee's, the acidity's a little too much, and it's not really hot enough ever, but, you know. Hey, listen, here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying don't ever file a complaint. Just file a complaint with me or somebody that, you, you know, and actually do something about it. And sometimes people complain, we don't realize things are going on and gives us an opportunity. Other times, we realize that, and we're able to share information, or here's why we do what we know, and people are like, oh, I, I, that's good to know. I understand now. It's not that we don't want you to complain. It's just don't complain out there because all that does is it creates dissonance for those people coming in and hear members of the church complaining about the church. So don't complain about your church. Second of all, don't boast about your church. Wasn't wasn't expecting that, were you? See, it's not about, hey, you got to come to our church. Our church is so hip and cool. We don't have stained glass windows. We don't have a steeple at our church. The band is next level, and when the preaching starts, it's like God himself is speaking directly to me. (laughs) Don't say that, even though it happens every week. (laughs) Now listen, if you have to err on this side, err on this side, right? (laughs) Err on the boasting side. But listen, if you boast, check this out. If you boast, boast about Jesus. Hey, listen. The last thing the world needs is another great church. We've got great churches all over the place. We've got empty seats in great churches. We've never done church as well as we've done church in in today's generation. And yet, we have more people who are far from God than at any other point in our history. It's not about doing church better. It's about getting our focus right. Our job as a church is not to be an end in ourselves, but to be a means to an end. We're not to be a barrier, we're to be a conduit. It's not about making the name Morning Star famous, Morning Star Church. It's about making the Morning Star, the bright Morning Star, Jesus Christ famous. To make him glorified in our community. That when we go out and we do those mission acts of service, we do the good works and people look at us, they would not glorify us, they would not glorify our church, but they would see our good deeds and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Our job as a church is to make famous the name that above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ, every person in our community 
would know that they are loved unconditionally by a God who would go to incredible lengths to lay down his life to seek and to save them. And God has invited you and me into this journey that we get to be a part of that conduit, that we get to bring our friends to Jesus. We bring them to the church, but we're gonna connect them to Jesus, right? It's imperfect people helping other imperfect people connect to the perfect love of God in Jesus Christ, amen? Amen. God, we thank you for never giving up on us, for sending your son Jesus, that great shepherd who would seek and save us when those moments when we have been lost in our lives. God, thank you that this church has made room, moved aside for 20 years nearly, has bought land, added services, built buildings, because they recognized that it wasn't just about themselves, that it was about themselves as well as their friends and family members, coworkers and neighbors who don't know you. And so thank you, God, for the sacrifices that the people of this church have made over the years to reach one more for Jesus Christ. And God, while we are gathered here in prayer, if there's a person in this room, if you're that person who maybe had a relationship with Jesus and you've wandered away, or maybe you've just never really known the love of God in Jesus Christ, then I invite you right now to just open your heart and say this prayer, God, forgive me of my sin. Thank you that you never gave up on me. Thank you for sending people into my life that would represent your light. I surrender. I receive the grace of Jesus Christ that he paid for my sin. I receive the gift of the Holy Spirit so I might know that I am chosen and favored and treasured by you and I would have the courage to follow hard after your purposes all the days of my life. And all the people at Morningstar agreed and said together, amen.